problems of the blind may soon be significantly reduced. To the blind student, there are never enough textbooks, and research papers in Braille, or recorded material. Today, Mike Taibbi visited a Cambridge research lab where they've invented a machine that can make any book talk. Forest tour and seven years ago, power. The user can take an active role in his reading. He can back up here line over again. He can go word by word. He can have words spelled out. It actually started to go with the 75 when there was this thing on the news about this man. And come up with a way that people are blind to us to be able to read. This is crazy. This is impossible. I've got to meet this person. Obviously, it was a life changer for me. It was really, really kind of big, you know. However big it was, it didn't matter because this is the first time a blind person would be able to read his or her private information. It was an amazing experience. The current cost of ten to twenty thousand dollars makes the machine practical only for libraries, institutions, or rehabilitation centers. The reader was very expensive back then. It had to be because the development effort was very expensive. So roughly 10 years ago, the Kurzweil reading technology began to become very prominent as an individual consumer device. Hey, it's very small. So this device actually is kind of bulky in your pocket, but this was our first model of a, a portable reading machine for the blind. And a blind person just snaps a picture and it reads it out of time. So cell phones are becoming more powerful, and we expect very soon that there will be a cell phone powerful enough to actually do this whole technology in a cell phone. I think we may see a time when having sight or not having sight doesn't really matter, you know? So I'm not gonna show the whole film. I encourage you to uh, purchase it and download it from the usual places. That gives a little flavor of it. It's quite historical. It looks at many inventions that Carswell was involved with and it extrapolates uh, what's going to happen in the future as the technology gets smaller and more powerful. So I've got this little idea of radical futurist. Now my own business card for quite a few years had the word future on it, futurist on it as well. But I was much more interested in a professional sense in the kinds of technology changes in the next 12 to 24 months. So a conventional humanist or mainstream humanists, if mainstream futurists, are looking at things like this. So this is something I picked off the web this morning. Top 20 potential digital game changers, moving away from the PC architecture to the iPad architecture, bring your own technology, social media marketing, pervasive virtualization, and so on. All important things if people are interested in making uh, bets for which businesses and which technologies will be important in the next few years. But Kurzweil, as I said, is more of a radical futurist. And in the film, there's a clip when he talks with one of his, his friends from college who set up the business with him. And they said, he said that Kurzweil set out basically his plan, which was that with technology, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk. And before we laugh too much, uh, the film does have some very touching moments when people who are blind express a huge amount of appreciation for the extra information that Kurzweil's inventions can bring. Kurzweil's radical and this is more than that. He's talking about computers not just getting smaller and smarter, but becoming enormously smarter than humans, leaving unmodified humans behind in terms of their capability, unless, that is, humans and computers can merge, which is that more of, our, uh, more of our own thinking is uh, done in computers which are built into our bodies, small nanobots, or in other ways in which our minds can be merged with the computers. And perhaps the most radical of all is Kurzweil's view that with these computers we'll model what's going on in the body better and better so we'll be able to address issues of aging and uh, decay. And so this might be Ray Kurzweil's future. Don't know if you can read that there. Ray Kurzweil, born 1948, died never so far. So that is the possible vision that this radical futurist uh, Ray Kurzweil is holding out. And we have to decide whether or not uh, we uh, agree with that and what the implications might be for our own lives. This is his most famous book, The Singularity is Near, which came out in 2005. My own first encounter with Kurzweil came uh, when his, with his books. It came about 12 years ago. It was a previous book called The Age of Spiritual Machines. And that title just leapt off the page, I remember, in the bookshop at me. I said, what on earth is a spiritual machine? 
Now notice the quote, which you might see there from something called Bill Gates. You might have heard of who uh, endorsed this right on the front cover with a unique look at the future. This word spiritual machines was a bit troubling. If it had been his previous book, the book which had come out in 1990, The Age of Intelligent Machines, that would make more sense to me, because I, in my own business life, I've been looking at the ways in which we are making machines more intelligent, whether it's handheld organizers or smartphones or other connected smart mobile devices. But the notion that machines could uh, enhance some of our emotional capabilities and our spiritual capabilities as well is quite challenging. And that's the same with many of other Kurzweil's ideas. They end up uh, making us really have a double take and it's no wonder that people push back and say, hang on, this can't be the case. But he bases a lot of his uh, work on extrapolation of technology trends. In the age of spiritual machines, there's a chapter for each of the next 10 years written in 1999, he has predictions what will be the case in 2009, 2019 and so forth. We don't want to get bogged down in the predictions for 2009, but there's a lot that has come true, large degree of purchases of books, videos and music, of digital downloads, lots of communications now digital and encrypted, learning at a distance through computers is commonplace. This is, by the way, from a summary of this book, which is on Wikipedia. Other things are uh, less, uh, here yet, translating telephones where each caller is speaking a different language are commonplace. That hasn't quite happened yet, although some of the things that Google is doing with intelligent translation might mean that it's not so far in the future after all. But rather than being bogged down and looking how many predictions did he get right and how many predictions did he get wrong, people can spend a long time over that, I think it's more fruitful to look at the underlying thinking. And the underlying thinking, in my view, is that of positive feedback cycles whereby trends will reinforce and accelerate each other. So where do computers come from? Computers come from being manufactured and designed. The first computers were designed by paper and pencil and were manufactured by hand, as it were, with simple, simple machinery. But later computers can participate in computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing. So there's a virtual feedback cycle there which results in computers becoming better, smarter, uh, and more efficient. It's the same with software. Software is built from software tools. Co uh, software developers spend a lot of their time using debuggers, compilers, profilers, optimizers, and so on. And as each generation of software gets better, the tools get better, which again allow a virtual cycle uh, feedback to come. Perhaps the most important positive feedback cycle is the one between technology and education. As, uh, where do we learn about technology? We learn about it from various kinds of education, formal and informal. But then with technology, we can make more material available, more widely to more people, which means that there are more people educated than ever before in the use of technology, which means there are more people able to improve technology than before. It's more complicated than just that two-way. As I said, there are more people involved. Uh, if I just briefly mention about the company I work for these days, it's Accenture. Accenture has more than 200,000 employees worldwide, but the largest uh, place, the largest location where we have large numbers of software engineers, technical consultants, is a place called Bangalore. It's the city in which we have the most employees. There's more than 20,000 employees in that city uh, as a whole, just by itself. And when I go there and meet the graduates that come off the, the training courses, I can see that they know a heck of a lot more about software engineering than I did when I was their age. And there's so many more of them. And by the way, it's not just individuals. The technology allows networks to be improved, and the network effect allows people to learn more quickly and exchange information more quickly. So that's the positive feedback cycles, which I think is the underlying driver for things such as the constant improvements in the technology, whether it's Moore's Law, which is well known, which is the improvement in semiconductor power, to less well-known exponential improvements such as Cooper's Law, Cooper's Law, it talks about how much uh, information can be transmitted across the wireless spectrum. Uh, you know, there's things you may have heard of 4G's coming soon, and before that there was 3G and 3.5G, and there's various names for it, such as uh, LTE and uh, HS8, HS, uh, UPA, HSDPA, and so forth. The uh, people who study this, and it's uh, named after Marty Cooper, who amongst other things was the first person to use a mobile phone, but uh, later on he studied how much information can be transmitted across the wireless spectrum. He said, by the way, broadly speaking, it has doubled every 30 months, every 30 months since 1897. What happened in 1897? 
was for Marconi first used a wireless transmission. So there are many of these trends which are driven, as I said, by more technology enabling more people to be more educated and apply their skills collectively to building yet better technology. And it drives improvements in all kinds of ways. The last curves I'm going to show here are by Rob Carlson, who's a biologist who's particularly interested in how easy it is to read strings of DNA and interpret what's happening there, and not only read, which is the dark line, but also improving your ability to write and create uh, new genetic sequences. And people say to Ray Coswell in response, when he points all these things out, he says, well, that's okay for information technology, but real life is much more messy, real life is more complicated. For example, it's true we can uh, sequence the genome, but we're still struggling to understand what the relationship is between that genome and the phenotype, the actual human body that's built out of it, and that's a very complicated thing to do. And I think it's true that some of the early promise of genetic uh, uh, improvements through this study have not yet been fulfilled, but Carswell's answer is, well, it really is a matter of time. As we have more powerful computers, we'll build better models and we'll study more fully what's happening. A lot of things that we can't predict. The technology change in many ways is getting faster. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to the first of these panelists, who in turn are going to either a talk or, in some cases, show a slide or involve the audience in other ways. Then we're going to move to an audience Q&A, an audience discussion, in which everybody in the audience has a chance to express their views on these general topics and also on the points that have been raised by the panelists. And then. Uh, we'll break into informal discussion sometime about 4 or 4.15. So that's setting the scene. And I'd now like to welcome up the first of the panelists, who is Anders Sandberg, who is a James Martin Research Fellow from the Oxford uh, University, actually at the Future of Humanity Institute there. And uh, Anders' list of research interests is a fascinating mix of things like cognitive enhancement, neurotechnology, global catastrophic risks, emerging technologies, and applied rationality. And he gets paid for it as well. Very lucky guy. Uh, he is also an associate from the Oxford Center of Neuroethics and the uh, Hero Center for Practical Ethics. So, Anders, what are your views on the uh, post transcendent man, Ray Kurzweil, and what we should think and do as a result? Thank you, David. So, I'm a lapsed computational neuroscientist. That means that uh, I, I might not be trained as a philosopher, but I'm hanging around in a philosophy department trying to look like a philosopher. And uh, so that hence I haven't got any slides. Uh, philosophers are great at hand -waving. I'm going to try to entertain you and convince you that you have So, my starting point is really, what's the singularity thing that everybody's talking about? And why do people connect it so strongly to Ray Kurzweil? Uh, we have just started a program at our institute uh, called the, uh, the Program on the Impacts of Future Technology. When we started thinking about contents, we called it the Singularity Program, because essentially we are interested in things related to the concept of singularity. And we soon realized, of course, that in order to actually get this uh, through the uh, university bureaucracy and get people to accept it, we actually had to remove that singularity word. Because people were not taking us seriously or thinking that we were some kind of subsidiary to a Kurzweil. And this is a bit of a problem, of course, because Kurzweil didn't come up with an idea. He's just very strongly associated with it because he's pretty much out there everywhere in the media. And the idea itself is also interesting because it's a complete mess. And if there is one thing I discovered philosophers are very good at, is kind of getting into these messy concepts and trying to untangle them, rip out the part that doesn't belong, and get to this weird little core that you can really get confounded by. <laughs> Which is great, of course, uh, as job security for philosophers. Uh, but sometimes, of course, getting confounded by something can also tell you interesting things. Especially when you pick it up from sufficiently small pieces that you can actually start doing good research. And eventually you figure out something about them, and then it moves out and becomes its own research department and doesn't admit that it was fathered by philosophy. <laughs> it's that. It's happened to the natural sciences, psychology, history, and the economy, and everything else. So it's going to happen here too. Right now we haven't even got the field of singularity studies in philosophy. In a few years I think it's going to be looming, and in a few years after that it's going, probably going to be a <coughs> department that doesn't admit that philosophers have anything with the subject. And basically, 
the core problem here is that right now we have a taboo word in our society, that is progress. Uh, back in the Victorian era, of course, everybody believed in progress, and it involved usually bigger steam engines and a bit of empire. And uh, gradually we realized the steam engines blew a bit, and empires are not all that we cracked up to be, and uh, we actually discovered that there are other ways of getting a better life. And we discovered we should not trust authorities so much. So gradually, the word progress became almost taboo in our uh, society. In intelligent discourse, you're not uh, supposed to say that something is progressing. No, things are changing in a lot of different ways. And with transhumanists, it's pretty common to say things are evolving, which is exactly the same thing as saying they're changing. But it doesn't necessarily have a directionality towards better. And I think that's accurate, because things are not necessarily going better, but they're certainly changing a lot. And a, the singularity is kind of very strongly tied into this idea that this change is doing something very interesting and actually fairly directional. Even if we might not dare call it progress, it certainly seems to be a lot like it. It might not be steam engines, but it might be bigger computers. Of course, smaller computers, but much more powerful. But when we go into the concept, we also get this muddy problem that even the term singularity was borrowed from mathematics. I think a lot of you know that uh, what a real mathematical singularity is. That's something like dividing one by zero. There is no such number that uh, the, uh, the number multiplied by zero produces a one. So one divided by zero is undefined. As uh, you divide uh, a smaller and smaller number, uh, one divided by a small number becomes a large number. As you go you get closer and closer to zero, you get larger and larger and larger numbers. But you can never reach one divided by zero because that doesn't exist. It's a breakdown of the model, you can say. And people get all mystified by this. It's not that strange. And it, but as a metaphor, it also produces a lot of confusion. Uh, one week said that the singularity, that's a kind of black hole in transhumanist philosophy where no light can be shed on what's actually going on, so you don't have to explain anything. And unfortunately, that's sometimes right. People do get a bit religious about this mysterious thing. So I'd like to try to separate the different meanings we use for singularity. And these meanings have been around for some quite some time, actually. So the Kurzweil. Uh, is very interesting accelerating technological change. And that has certainly been going on for a very long time. You can measure, measure it in, in terms of how many kilometers uh, we can travel for a weekly wage, how much competition we can do, how, how cheap we can produce beer. And it turns out that there is something like more slow for Japanese beer too. Unfortunately for the Japanese, it's a pretty slow more slow. It's not getting that amazing. You can't predict that in the year 2100 we're going to be swimming in beer. <laughs> But this accelerating technological change, that's due to a lot of feedbacks. And when things speed up, they might get strict. So this was observed by John von Neumann, who was probably one of the last century's absolutely biggest uh, minds. So in, uh, one quote from his friend uh, Stanislav Ulam was, one conversation center on the ever-accelerating progress of technology and changes in the mo mode of human life, which gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human effect, as we know them, could not continue. And this was in 1958. So that was an enormous pace of technology advance in the 50s. Which, of course, compared to what we think we have now, is absolutely nothing. So there are two interesting components here. One is the sense that human affairs will really, really change. And there is also a rupture. Something will not just change in quality, it will be something completely different. Another approach is, of course, to say that, well, it's about intelligence. A lot of what Kurzweil is talking about is technology that makes us or things smarter. And this feedback might, of course, turn on itself. So we might imagine a machine that helps us make better machines. And uh, together with these better machines, engineers make even better machines, and the feedback speeds up faster and faster and faster. Or we might imagine a piece of software that writes software. And that software, of course, writes even better software, and so on and so on. Uh, I.J. Good coined the term intelligence explosion back in 1965. He wrote, let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines, there would uh, then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of intelligence of man would be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention man need ever make. 
then he goes on to point out that that's of course why you really want to get it right. <laughs>